This is ACMI News, recognized nationwide as the first place winner of the 2022 Hometown Media Award for News Access. From McLennan Park to Spy Pond, from Poets Corner to the Mystic River, we have Arlington covered, giving you stories that count from people who care. Reliable, trustworthy, dependable. This is the 2022 nationwide award-winning ACMI News. Hello, and welcome to this special edition of ACMI News. I'm Jeff Barn. While preparing to sell his home in Alexandria, Virginia, three years ago, retired U.S. Secret Service agent Clint Hill, now 90 years of age, uncovered a long-forgotten steamer trunk in the garage, which would eventually produce a never-before-told story. Mr. Hill and his wife Lisa, co-authors on three previous books, pried the trunk open for the first time in a half century and found a slice of U.S. history that had been long abandoned by its caretaker. Inside, scores of never-before-seen photographs, handwritten notes, personal gifts, and treasured mementos from one of the world's most sophisticated and powerful women. The mysterious trunk and its contents gave birth to the Hill's latest book, My Travels with Mrs. Kennedy. Clint Hill was First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy's most trusted Secret Service agent. He was by her side as they traveled the globe together in places like Paris, Vienna, India, Greece, and Dallas, Texas. It was Clint Hill who in November of 1963 jumped on the back of the presidential limousine, pushing Mrs. Kennedy back into the car, covering her and a fatally wounded President John F. Kennedy with his body. Here now is our interview with the Hills, who instead of throwing the trunk out, tell an intimate story full of tender moments, private laughs, profound sorrow, and deep affection for Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. Did you expect to put out a new book of this no. nature anyway? No, not at all. This thing hit us by surprise, because, partly because of COVID. Because uh, we were, you know, in quarantine, <laughs> like everybody else, and uh, looking for something to do, and <laughs> that popped up, and she, it was her bright idea, <laughs> and it, it worked out well. Well, yeah, it just so happened that we had been back in Alexandria, <laughs> Uh, just a few months before, you know, the COVID pandemic hit and um, came across all these mementos and we were kind of unpacking everything out here in California and yeah, it just sort of evolved into this book and um, we're really happy with it. Well, congratulations again. And also during COVID, you got married. You used your Thank time you. very wisely. <laughs> Thank you. I've, I've been a very lucky man. Now, uh, let's get into this new book. This is fascinating stuff. My travels with Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, you hooked me like a largemouth bass uh, in the first few seconds when I opened the book and saw chapter one, The Trunk. So tell me the story about The Trunk. Well, as Lisa said, we were back in Washington, D.C. in uh, the late tw uh, part of tw 2019. And uh, I owned a home in Alexandria, Virginia that I had bought in 1967. And I hadn't lived there for years, and uh, it was time to sell it. All of a sudden, she's out in the garage, which is underneath the house, and she's hollering at me, there's something here, Clint, what is this? And so I go out there, and she is uncovered. She had removed a wet vac, <laughs> which was sitting on top of this trunk, and the trunk had a label on it, painted name, my name, Clinton Hill, the White House, Washington, D.C. And she said, uh, you know, you told me that you know, there was a, tr or a trunk, but I wasn't so sure you were being honest with me. No, I didn't see that. Well, I'm, uh, I think you did. <laughs> but anyway, there it was in living color. And so, of course, you know, wouldn't you want to see what's inside the trunk? You know, and yeah. I asked him, you know, well, what's in here? Can we open it up? He says, I have no idea. I haven't opened it in more than 50 years. And <laughs> there had been a flood in the basement there in the with the garage area. And that thing it was in there at the time. So I had no idea what condition anybody, anything that was in there would be in. She wanted to open it right then and there. And I convinced her by saying, 
you know, there might be a lot of bugs and worms and I think you said so, snakes and rats. Bo probably did say it. <laughs> and I convinced her that we should wait till the next day when we had some rubber gloves and uh, plastic bags to put junk in. You put on the rubber gloves, you go back to the house, you see it, it says Clinton Hill White House, Washington, D.C. You open it up, and as you said, you found some some trinkets, but you found paperwork from Dwight Eisenhower, you found paperwork from Harry S. Truman, you found more than 200 photographs of you, Clint, and, and Jacqueline Kennedy. Yeah, we did find a treasure trove of things that as we started writing the book, we actually curated a lot of photographs too and discovered photographs that um, had never been seen before, pictures with him in it that helped tell these stories that he was telling me. Yeah, so I, we put it all together that well, way. And we found, she found things in the trunk that uh, even, they, they really surprised me that I re had forgotten that they were in there, such as, uh, a camera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was a special camera given to me by Mark Shaw, a photographer from Life Magazine. It was a Minox miniature camera, usually used by spies to uh, take photographs of uh, documents. But I used it to take photographs of crew members on boats that we were using and things. So I'd have some means of identification in the event anything went wrong. I'd, I'd know who these people were. So, I mean, there were all kinds of things. I had burned, I thought I had burned all my notes because I was trying to avoid having to be interviewed by someone for a, a book or a magazine article. And I thought the best way to do it is just to say, I don't have any notes and I don't remember. And so I burned all my notes, I thought. And here we discovered this notebook from 1964. I always carried a notebook in my pocket. All the agents did. We kept track of everything that was happening, times, weather conditions, where we were, everything. Everything was really in good shape. It certainly smelled musty. You know, there was mold in there, definitely. But um, we just started pulling things out. And he and he would say, well, see, look, it's just a bunch of junk. And I, they were uh, Air Force One playing cards in their <laughs> wrapper still. And Zippo lighters with the presidential seal on them tie clips from President Kennedy's campaign. And he said, see, just a bunch of junk. <laughs> and nobody else called it junk, just me. I guess. <laughs> that's not junk, that's, that's history. Exactly. We haven't had a first lady who's had young children for such a long time. Are you optimistic about fulfilling this role in the same way you did before? Yes, I think it doesn't matter what else you do if you don't do that part well, if you fail your husband and your children. Um, that really is the role which means the most to me, though obviously I have a deep sense of obligation for the others, but that's the one that comes first. I remember you telling me in the previous interview that when they told you you're going to be in the Secret Service and you're going to be looking after the First Lady, you hadn't, you didn't want anything to do with it. Well, I really did not because I knew how the agents acted or what they, how they have had to work in the previous administrations with the Trumans and, and the Eisenhowers. You know, Mrs. Eisenhower didn't like to fly. So when if she went any place, she went by train. And the only place she'd ever go really was to Denver. And the reason she went there was to see her mother. Uh, she just didn't do anything. She played cards, played canasta. <laughs> She'd go shopping. It was not a very interesting job for the guys that had it. And I was fearful that that's how I was going to be. It did turn out that way. It turned out that I had the best job in the Secret Service, bar none. And I think even most of the agents would say that. that <laughs> I was very fortunate because of the job I had. Uh, from Mamie Eisenhower to Jacqueline uh, Kennedy, that that's a 180 right there, a clear one. Yeah. It really is, yeah. I do not uh, think it altogether inappropriate 
to introduce myself to this audience. I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy uh, to Paris, and I've enjoyed it. They came to Paris the end of May, 1961. It was only two and a half days, I guess. So it was a lot of activity over a short period of time. And I was concerned about how she was going to hold up, but she did well. She was the show because she could speak fluent French, did so with everybody that she spoke to in Paris. It was amazing to watch. And I got a whole new picture of who she actually was during that trip. She always called you Mr. Hill, and you always addressed the First Lady as Mrs. Kennedy. There's a bond that I'm sure she didn't have with any other Secret Service agent. I mean, you could, you could, and in this book you mentioned it, you, you could see her look, and you knew exactly what she needed, wherever she was, and whatever stress she was facing. You could almost read minds. That's it. She wanted to, to uh, test the, you know, how far she could go or how far, <laughs> what she could do. She was very good. I mean, she's just a wonderful person to work with. Um, it was a different relationship toward the end. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. If I had reacted just a little bit quicker, I could have, I guess. And I'll live with that to my grave. Well, I, in a sense, I've made peace with it. And I understand it fully. I still feel that we failed. I still feel a sense of guilt that I wasn't able to do more than I did faster. Um, but I understand there's only so much you can do. So, and it wasn't until I met Lisa in 2009 that I, and I just started talking about what had happened and everything. Because I'd never discussed it with anybody. Talked to the Warren Commission. They asked pointed questions, but I uh, really never talked to anybody. No agents. None of my family members. I never talked to anybody. None of the agents actually did. It was too, too and, and some of them, even after we were writing books and things, I remember going to one agent and saying to him, hey, Don, I want to ask you some questions. He said, Clint, I can't talk about that day. It's just too painful. And I mean, this was years later, so I wasn't the only one affected. Uh, many, many, many people were affected. Yeah, but you were the only one who reacted physically. Um, I'm, well, I was I'm... the only one who had a chance. The way things were set up, I was in the car behind the president's car on the left-hand side. The agents that were on the right-hand side, when the shot rang out, they turned to see where the shot was coming from, as I did from the left on the left hand side. When I did it, my eyes crossed the back of the president's car, and I saw his reaction. When they turned to see the noise, they were turning away from the car, and just, and uh, they did not see what happened in the presidential vehicle. So that made all the difference in the world. I was the only one that had that chance to get there, get on top, and provide protection for him. One thing
something Clint has uh, always wanted to share with people is what Mrs. Kennedy was really like. And that's a question as we've traveled these last years, almost invariably he gets is what was Jackie Kennedy really like? And through all of these photographs and these um, mementos and gifts that she gave him, it shows, I think, really who she was. You know, there are photographs of her um, in rain boots and a raincoat uh, with Caroline in Middleburg, you know, taking her in the pony lead line, teaching her how to ride a pony, um, all those sorts of things, the behind the scenes, not when she's, I mean, there are a few pictures of her in the glamorous gowns and the White House functions, but what Clint saw was her, um, you know, when she was in private, and yeah. that's what she was really like. Her and Caroline sitting at the, at a table in Italy eating spaghetti. I mean, just like anybody else would. I mean, you know, uh, they were just having a good time. She was so private um, yeah. that she rarely gave interviews. So that contributed to the mystique. Here was this glamorous, beautiful woman, and then the tragic widow, and then she was just hounded, you know, for the rest of her life. And, um, you know, this is a, a tribute, I think, to her. And um, and like in all our books, Clint doesn't reveal anything salacious or embarrassing, you know, anything like that. So he's he just always wants to be respectful of her. And, um, you know, that's what we've always tried to do. things going um, back to the Palm Beach incident um, that was you know we we talked about that a lot whether we should include that in the book or not and um, it was a hard chapter for Clint to revisit um, he you know he just wasn't sure he wanted to put that out there but in the end we decided that um, it could help other people to know that he at age 31 almost took his own life so he would have missed out on 59 years of living. And um, so hopefully, you know, other people can see that they're not alone. And Clint has advice for people who are struggling like that. Yes, because, you know, I had what is now called PTSD is what I was struggling with. And I didn't even have a name for it back in those days. But uh, I, when I have the opportunity to talk to these people that have had problems because they've been in the military in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, they come back. I mean, they've seen such tragic things happen and to their friends. And, um, I tell them that the best thing you can do is find somebody you trust and be, have a willingness to sit down and talk to that person, no matter who it is. It can be a minister, it can be a priest, a rabbi, a teacher, a mother, your father. I'm just the best friend. Just talk about what is bothering you. If you get it out that way, verbally, by talking about it, it's going to be relief to you, and you are going to do much better going forward than you really think. And so please, if you have that opportunity, just unload. Let yourself free yourself of that uh, terrible stuff. That's Don't be ashamed to cry. Um, you know, I think that's one thing, you know, Clint has shown that it, that that's okay. You know, everybody has emotions. We're all human. Very true. We're in this together. So, um, yeah, so that was one thing that we, that we wanted to share with the book. And for more than half of her lifetime, she remained the keeper of the flame. Tonight, Jackie Kennedy Onassis, dead at age 64. It was 1994, you realized Jackie Kennedy was passing on. You watched Ted Koppel announce that she had passed and you wrote, I sat there staring at the TV, images of her playing over and over. My memories right there on the screen. I was overcome with a deep sense of loss. The tears streamed down my face and I was not ashamed. It was, it's nothing but the utmost respect for someone who I'm sure in your mind uh, deserved it. Well, yes, 
I had utmost respect for Mrs. Kennedy, and she respected me. We trusted each other implicitly, so, uh, and that's what made our relationship work. We are joined here today at the site of the eternal flame lit by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis 31 years ago to bid farewell to this remarkable woman whose life will for her funeral you were able to make it there and and in, the, in this book you basically said we were together uh one more time i remember you telling me in our last interview you don't like the fact that on her gravestone it's got the word onassis on it correct i never never liked that i never referred to her in that respect i never call her that i don't really respond when people call her that I knew him, uh, and I didn't like him. I didn't trust him. Uh, the only reason I could ever think of why she married him was strictly because he could provide security like no one else for the children. He had all these things that were going to be available to her. Are you sorry you didn't write this book before? I mean, I know you found the trunk, but if you did have access to this material, do you wish this this would have come out 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago, or is this perfect timing? I, I kind of think it's perfect timing. Um, I do too. I think this country needs a little... Uh, Nostalgia. But yeah, you know. Some good news, <laughs> you know, yeah. just hearkening back to a different time. Um, it's it's comforting in a way. I think it's, um, it's, it's educational. A, it's a way it can be. And it's the way it should be. Uh, and it's unfortunate that it is that way now. You've seen, come on, you've seen the, the 60s and 70s. You, you've been there. You, you, were on, you were on the front row there. I was in, I was in uh, Chicago, 1968, Democratic National Convention. Uh, I, I was up close and personal with that, too. So, um, yeah, I've been there, done that. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I like how you flippantly say that. I've been there. I know. Yeah, it's just the that's got to be the best been there, done that. Lisa, said. call 1 800 junk. I don't know what the hell this thing is. <laughs> It's fascinating that uh, it just by happenstance you you found this when you, when I I mean if I were with you and saw Clinton Hill White House Washington it'd be like <laughs> let's open it up it's Christmas morning I, I I would love to see that and thank God Clint you have Lisa because you, you just said it was junk and it's not junk I mean you know everyone in the world would appreciate what's well, in that trunk I know yeah. what if she hadn't been there if I'd have gone out there alone I'd have just gone into the house looked around picked up the phone dialed one eight hundred junk. <laughs> they didn't until they got there and I'd appointed that mm. the whole in, inside of the house would have been in a uh, garbage truck outside well the, and those people in the truck at 1-800-JUNK would have written a book <laughs> yeah, exactly. they, they probably could have <laughs> In 1958, Clint Hill served on the detail for President Eisenhower before being assigned to Mrs. Kennedy in 1960. He stayed on with Mrs. Kennedy and her children until 1964. For the next 11 years, Mr. Hill would be assigned to Presidents Johnson, Nixon, and Ford before retiring in 1975. He's the last surviving person who was in the presidential limousine on that fateful day in Dallas, Texas, 59 years ago. When he announced this new book, Mr. Clint Hill tweeted, I think we can all use a little Camelot right now. I'm Jeff Barn. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.